Who knows about the potter's wheel? Anybody read the lesson? Yes. <laughs> okay. Who knows? Who, 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 what's the potter's wheel? Anybody heard the story? I mean, come on, y'all heard it preached before, right? <laughs> Some of uh, you, you kind of sounds vaguely uh, familiar. Like something about the potter's wheel and about being on a potter's wheel and how the potter molds the clay, right? Yeah. And then how we have to let Jesus mold us and let the Lord mold us, right? Yeah. Remember Brother Watley's message about the potter's wheel? About stay up on the wheel or something, stay up on the wheel or something about a couple of years ago or a year ago, whatever it was. Boy, he was fired up about that. So that really touched me. He said, let the Lord mold you and make you. Well, we're going to start in uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, the central truth for today's lesson is only by yielding ourselves to God can we fulfill His will for our lives. Only by yielding ourselves to God. So there's a process that we have to do, right? Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a part on us, right? I mean, we can be rebellious and stiff necked and stubborn and not yield to the will of God, and then what happens? Destruction, <laughs> Destruction trouble, problems, yeah. you know, right? But if we if we if we yield if we yield ourselves to the Lord, is life going to be better? Is it going to be a bed of roses? No. <laughs> Why? Because God that promises to be a bed of roses. Well, mainly because there's a there's somebody out there that's trying to destroy your life. Yeah. Yes. Right. So when you're living for God, what comes against you? <laughs> Everything else, the enemy, right? So the enemy's not going to allow you to live a life for God and not come against you, right? right. So, so right. I mean, it's not a bed of roses, absolutely. And anybody teaches that, they're, I think they got their theology wrong, but but the end result, is it worth it? Yes. Well, absolutely. Come on, think about it. I mean, is heaven worth the journey? No matter how much hell you go through, is heaven worth the journey? Most people in their right mind would say yes. <laughs> so anybody would say no, they're... <laughs> Not in the right mind. <laughs> but that's what we're facing talk about. That's part of it, right? <laughs> uh, this lesson revolves around a parable about the work of a potter teaching the sovereignty of God to do what he will the lives of his people, like as a potter molds a vessel of clay according to his own will. God is sovereign, but we have the freedom to choose. And in choosing to, to submit to God's will, there is life and blessing and in resisting his will, there is self-destruction and death. Is it better to be submitted to God? <laughs> so what did the, the lesson just say? If you're not submitted to God, what's going to happen? Death and destruction, right? The end result is death and destruction, right? So you don't have to be submitted to God, but there might be a time where everything's good, everything's roses, everything's going great for you. And then guess what happens? Carpet comes right up under your feet and all of a sudden, bam. Or you might live a whole life just totally deceived like that. Then all of a sudden you wake up in hell and you go, Hey, I didn't know this. <laughs> and the devil says, Uh-huh, I had you the whole time. You didn't even know it. So the end result is always going to be death and destruction, right? If you're not living for God. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, um, how God used the potter's wheel to teach Jeremiah his wheel. Uh, we're talking about the God's sovereignty is illustrated. And we're going to, I'm going to read uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. We begin in verse 2, Jeremiah 18, verse 2. It says, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So, Jeremiah is told to go down to watch the potter work on this clay, right? At, towards the end of the lesson, it talks about how he's probably done this a hundred times. He's probably walked by this and seen this a hundred times. But God had a specific purpose for him to go down to what? The potter at work. How many of you have you seen something in life that's so simple and you've seen it a hundred times, all of a sudden God will speak to you something about it? Something as simple as a butterfly. And he says, that's my creation. You're like, whoa. But you've seen a butterfly a hundred times, right? And all of a sudden God speaks to you, that's my creation. So God uses the simple things to teach us, right? 
Thank God, because if it was any more difficult than that, I wouldn't get it. <laughs> I'm very simple. I'm easy to entertain. I mean, going down the road, I come out of a mud pit one time. I come out of the road and mud just slinging off my tires and everything else. And I was just having a good time. I thought that was the funniest thing. My buddy's like, you're crazy. I mean, it was just funny. I mean, mud's just going everywhere. Anyway, just how simple I am. It just don't take a lot to amuse me. <laughs> so when God speaks to me through cartoons and stuff like that, I get it. I mean, right? I understand what he's trying to tell me. <laughs> so thankful that God uses the simple things in life to teach us. Because... When he was talking to the farmers, he used terms that the farmers understood. When he talks to us, he used things that we understand, right? And thank God for that, because if he was a um, uh, way up here type of God, then we never would understand what he's trying to get us to understand, right? So the simple things are great, right? And if you can't explain the gospel to a seven-year-old, then your theology's too high. That's what I've heard taught. If you can't teach it to a seven-year-old, then you're just too complicated. It shouldn't be that complicated, right? So God uses this potter working on the clay to teach Jeremiah what he's going to do with Israel. It says, God spoke to Jeremiah, commanded him to visit the potter's house. And he said, there. So when God tells you to be somewhere for a specific, specific purpose, God's got you there to see something or hear something, right? How many of us have been that and they go, you go wherever God's told you to go, and you're like, what am I here for? <laughs> right? <laughs> and you don't understand. And then Jeremiah says, he told him to go and listen, right? God told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and listen, and I'll talk to you there. And how many of us have been in those situations where God told you to go to Walmart, and you're like, okay. And now you're in Walmart going, okay. And then God says, go speak to this person. Or I mean, I've heard people talk about God told him to go to McDonald's one time at 2 o'clock in the morning. What? <laughs> So you got to went to McDonald's, there was a lady in line you had to talk to about Jesus. So, I mean, crazy things like that happen all the time, right? So, there, God said, I will cause you to hear my words. God often reveals truths that we need to know and things that are quite ordinary. In this instance, truth was revealed in the ordinary work of the potter. So, it was the simple things that God was using. It was the simple things that God was using to teach Jeremiah what he was going to talk to about Israel, right? And thank God we, Jesus has given us those simple things that we can understand them. At the potter's house, Jeremiah simply observed the potter at work, listening for what God would say. How many of us miss him because we don't listen? Did I say that right? How many of us miss because we don't listen for what God is saying? How many of us have been too busy to hear what God said? How many of us uh, have heard what God said and don't do what God said? <laughs> this is yes, <laughs> this is no. <laughs> so I'm not sure which way you are talking about. <laughs> but <laughs> God has said, <laughs> let's see. Where, where am I at? <laughs> okay. In order, let's see. Listen to what God would say. And then Jeremiah heard God say, and behold, as a Clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in my hands, O house of Israel. God had control over Israel's destiny, as surely as a potter has control over the clay vessel he molded on his spinning wheel. So Jeremiah, or God is telling Jeremiah at this point right here, he says, look, I got Israel in my hands. I have the destiny of Israel in my hands. You know, God created Israel out of one man, right? God chose Abraham to be Israel, right? Israel came out of one person. God didn't pick a nation and turn them into his people. God grew a nation out of one man. Right? So this is God's nation. This God, he was specifically, uh, Israel was specifically designed to be God's. Right? <clears throat> so we know that Israel was designed for God's purpose. Okay? Let's see here. However, belief in the sovereignty of God is not fatalism. Fatalism is that whatever will be, will be, and there's nothing that we can do about it. God is a potter, but we are the innate clay, in andamic clay. We are living souls, and God gives us the freedom to accept or reject his will for our lives. God's response will be according to our response to him. 
So how God responds to you is how you respond to God. Uh, <laughs> she said it last week. She said, uh, John 14, 14. You remember what you read? Yeah. What was it? That we're friends to God. If we obey God's commands or Jesus' commands, he says we are his friends. Right? If we obey what God tells us to do, then we're called his friends. So the inverse is true also. If we don't obey what God says to do, then we're not his friends. It's very sobering to think about. All right? So which part of the book do we observe? Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's from a good people first. Yeah, it's from end uh, from uh, from table contents to maps, right? <laughs> cover to cover, right? So we don't get to pick and choose which part we want to listen to, right? So if it says to uh, go to your brother and ask for forgiveness, what are you supposed to do? And ask for forgiveness. If he says to repent and be baptized, what are you supposed to do? Repent, be baptized. <laughs> God did not put anything in the book haphazardly. <laughs> Everything in the book is for our benefit. Even the hard stuff. <laughs> when it says, love thy neighbor as thyself, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to love them, right? <laughs> love your brothers and sisters, no matter what they've done to you, right? We're supposed to do those things. And God says, if I do those things, I am his friend. But if I don't do those things, then I can't be his friend. So... God is telling us here in his word that if we observe and do what he tells us to do, then he will respond according to his promises. Right? The blessings and the cursings are intended upon how we respond to what his word is. There's blessings and cursings. Who wants the blessings? Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Who wants the cursings? Okay, I didn't see too many hands come up on I didn't see any hands come up on that. So if we want the blessings, we observe what the word says to do, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't observe what the word says to do, then curses will fall upon us right God's response to us will be according to our response to him but it wasn't hard for God to love us ma'am I said it wasn't hard for God to love us he did a whole lot right for us because he didn't have to do it though. right but he did so why can't we love we love he loved us in well, spite of everything we did, but it still loved us. He didn't have a sister like I had. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a brother like I had. <laughs> you know, he, he don't know my brother. No, anyway, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> he didn't have to put up with my brother like I did, you know. <laughs> all right. But think about that, what Miss Ellis was talking about. Right. Despite of all of our wickedness and all of our meanness and everything that's bad about the human heart, God says, I still love you. No matter what. Unconditionally. Right? So how are we supposed to love? Unconditionally unconditionally right because if you don't love unconditionally then when you need love what's going to happen to you there's going to be conditions upon your love and then you're going to need it too mercy trumps judgment right yeah. mercy trumps judgment right because someday you will need mercy yeah. <laughs> someday we will all need mercy none of us have arrived <laughs> none of us are on the top of the pedestal none of us are above God's judgment, right? We all need mercy. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, where would we be? Lost. Lost. Under the condemnation and the judgment of God. Right? But it's Jesus that gives us the right relationship with the Father. Right? But that's what it is. Because God is sovereign, we cannot ultimately defeat what God's, God wills to do. By submission to God's will for our lives, we are blessed by Him, and through Jesus Christ, He gives us everlasting life. If we reject and resist God's will for our lives, we do so at our own destruction. Opposition to God leads only to our own ruin and everlasting condemnation. I'm reading out this one right here if you want to follow. It might be a little easier. So, page 42. Um, Opposition to God only leads to our own ruin and our own condemnation, right? So, can we ultimately change the will of God? <laughs> no. God is going to get what God said He's going to get, right? With or without us. He does not need us. We understand that, right? We get to be a part of God's big plan. We are allowed to be a part of God's big plan. He allows us to be a part of that. 
But ultimately, God's will is going to be done on the earth. Regardless of what man does or what my, mankind does as a whole, God's will will be accomplished on the earth. Right? Yeah. He'll move you. He'll separate you. He'll destroy you. I mean, right here he's talking about, I'm going to destroy uh, Jerusalem and uh, Judah if they don't do what I'm telling them to do. He's not scared <laughs> to destroy a nation to get his will accomplished on the earth. Right? And that's what he's talking about right here. He says, look, I have the destiny of Israel in the palm of my hands. God has your destiny in the palm of his hands. You choose whether you get in or out of the palm of God's hands. Right? You choose whether you obey God's will or not. What is God's will? Well, there's 66 books that describe what God's will is for your life, right? And we put it in one big book called the Bible. That's God's will for your life. The things that God wrote in the book are meant to uh, guide and direct our paths. And when we need comfort, we search the scriptures to understand what God's trying to tell us to do, right? So if we are following what the Word says, then we're in the will of God. Everybody follow? But if you're not following the, the Word, then you're not in the will of God. Now what if we do half of the Word? It's still not the will of God. <laughs> right? If we take one or two and we go those wholeheartedly, we follow those exactly explicitly and do everything that word says, but two or three of them, we just kind of... <laughs> the Bible says if you're guilty of one, one of the laws, then you're guilty of the whole law, right? <laughs> so, we have to follow the Bible as a whole. It hurts sometimes. It ain't fun sometimes. It ain't easy sometimes. <laughs> you know, things happen in our lives and we go, my goodness, what's going on? God, why are you doing this? Why did this happen? Why is this going on? And God says, wait, wait, do you trust me? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, God says, do you trust me? Yes, is the correct response. And then he says, then trust me. This is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where you're ultimately tested because we think we trust God when everything's peachy and everything's going our way, right? But when something adverse comes along in our lives, then God says, are you really trusting me? Why did this happen to me? Why did this, I don't know, accident, why did this sickness, why did this death happen in my life? God is ultimately in control of the whole thing. Irregardless of what man does who man uh, elects, who man puts in positions of authority, who man does anything. Ultimately, God is in control of the whole thing, right? Yeah. He knows how to accomplish his will upon the earth with or without us. In the parable of the potter, what does the fact that the potter starts over as many times as needed to mold the vessel he desires tell us about God's work in our own lives? Hourly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> second by second. Okay. Yeah, then I, you know, I make it about 30 seconds sometimes, maybe about a minute. And, oh, that's not all over again. <laughs> but what does that mean? God has given us as many chances as we need to submit to his will and do what he's asking us to do, right? God will start this process all over again. So that means that you cannot fall too far from God. Right? As long as there's repentance in your heart, you cannot fall from God. God's doing absolutely everything He possibly can to make sure you make it into heaven. He'll send a friend, a text, a billboard, a commercial, television show, whatever, to get you the word. A friend, right? Because where does God ultimately want you to end up at? With him. That's God's ultimate destination is to be in heaven with him. What was hell created for? It wasn't created for us. Right? It was not created for us. But do people go to hell? Yes, absolutely they do. Why? Because they don't listen to God. They reject his redemption. They reject what he has done for them, what Jesus Christ has done for them. So... Ultimately, is it is it our choice? It is. 
Now, <clears throat> some people might get to heaven and blame God and say they didn't do this or God didn't do this or God didn't do that, but it'll bring back to your remembrance that person that was in Walmart that tried to talk to you and you didn't want to listen to them. Or that person that was standing on a street corner preaching or whatever. You know, I don't know what it's going to be for you. But those that are lost going to hell, God's going to say, look, I sent you know, multiple people down your path to talk to you. You would not listen. Well, that's where Israel is right here. Jeremiah has been bringing this word to him. He says, look, if y'all don't change y'all's ways, y'all are headed down a path of destruction. And I'm going to read something that's going to blow your minds. But anyway, but he's trying to warn them. He's trying to tell them, look, y'all need to come unto repentance. But Israel says, look, mm -mm, don't want nothing to do with your repentance. And that's that's a crazy thought to think about. Somebody that's so stuck in their sin, stuck in their ways, that they just do not want to receive uh, redemption or uh, forgiveness because they're just so stuck in their sins, right? So, man's stubborn heart revealed. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 11. Now therefore go to now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem saying thus saith the Lord behold I frame evil against you and devise a and devise a device against you return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good and they said there is no hope but we will walk after our own devices and we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart goodness gracious jeremiah 7 15 thus saith the lord cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the lord jeremiah 7 17 9 the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his way and according to the fruit of his doing. Back up in Jeremiah 18, <laughs> verse 12, it says, There is no hope, but we walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imagination of of our evil hearts. <laughs> the prophet says, come and repent. And he said, nope. I want to do what's evil in my heart. I'm going to do everything that I can imagine that's evil in my heart. That's what they responded to Jeremiah's word. Think about that. That just, <laughs> it's like slapping God in the face saying, I will not receive your redemption. I do not want to be redeemed. Right? Right? I want to do the evil that is in my heart. Have we seen people like that? Do we know people that are like that? Have we seen people in history that are like that? Absolutely we have. Everything that they do is evil. Everything that they imagine is evil. So they do what the, even the mind can imagine. The Bible talks about some of that. You're not even supposed to even think about what they do, right? Because let's not even think about it. But these people are so wicked in their hearts, it says, I do not want your redemption. I want to do the evil that's in my heart. That blows me away to think about that. And here's what's even more mind-blowing. It's what Miss Ella was talking about, how God loves us and everything else. And God still created us knowing that we were going to do that. <laughs> what? <laughs> God created us knowing... That at some point in history that we were all going to turn our backs on him and say, no, I'd rather do evil. <laughs> Goodness gracious. And he still yet says, I'm still going to create you. <laughs> Ma'am? And still loves us. Absolutely. Man, lightning bolt. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Starting all over. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> all right. <laughs> or this thing is too imperfect. I can't do anything for it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> he could have made us where we didn't have a choice. Right. Angels. Angels. Free will. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, angels, they're created to serve God. Right. They have no free will. Right. 
They are created to serve God. But he gave us the free will to choose to serve him. And that's an amazing thing to think about. So, why did he do it that way? Because he did Go ahead. It means a lot. Like if somebody loves you because they want to right. versus you try to make them. Right. I mean, it's, it's a whole different, it's not even really love. You're trying to make right. somebody do it. You know? Right. So, if you're children that always come up to you, I love you, can I have a dollar? <laughs> I love you, can I have ten dollars? <laughs> As you get older, can I love you, can I have a hundred dollars? <laughs> you know, right? Right? <laughs> or if they just come up to you to say, I love you, you can tell the difference between the two, right? Everybody knows the difference between those things. So if we walk up to God and just say, I love you, just because you're God. If your kids come up to you and tell you those type of things, how does that make you feel as a parent? Oh, right? Just, Mommy, I love you. Give him a <laughs> then you give him a dollar, right? Now you, now you feel compelled to give him a dollar, right? Exactly. But, but when you feel that, I mean, you can kind of get a small glimpse of what God's heart feels like when his kids say, I love you, regardless of the circumstances in my life, regardless of how bad it gets, regardless of what I go through. God, you're still in control of my life. God, I still trust you no matter what. Those are some pretty tough times. Those are some pretty tough statements to make uh, during the tough times. No matter what I go through, God, I still trust you. And when we do that, that shows our commitment to God irrelevant of what we can receive from him. And those are the times that God goes, that's my boy. That's my girl right there. <laughs> Just like he told uh, the devil about Job. Everybody knows the story about Job. But in the end, Job says, I will not say anything evil against my God. All right? <laughs> no matter what he went through, I mean, whew, <laughs> we, we ain't suffered yet. <laughs> so, but these people here in this particular time frame, they are so evil in their heart that he says, no matter what you bring to us, I still would, pref would prefer to do the evil that is in my heart. Jeremiah 18 11 is a warning that God gave Jeremiah to speak to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. This warning was of God's impending judgment accompanied by a call to the people of Judah and Jerusalem to repent. With strong implication that if they would repent... God will not send against them his in intended judgment. God tells us the exact same thing. If you will return from your wicked ways, and if you will repent and return from your wicked ways, then the judgment, my wrath that is to come, will not come upon you. But Satan, the God of this world, has blinded people to that reality. All of us were blind at one time. And all of us have been brought into the glorious light. And thank God for that. The only difference between me and them is I have accepted it and they have not. Right? I am part of the beloved and they are not. But God still looks at them the same as he looks at me. He still has the same compassion on them as he did on me. So when we see people sinning, we shouldn't go, Ooh, they're sinning. We should go, Ooh, they need Jesus. Yeah. Because at one point, we were the one over here on this side. And the Christian was looking at us going, my gosh, look how bad that person is. Right? So we over here cannot point our fingers at those over there. Mm -mm. That ain't the way it works. We understand that, right? We, we understand that concept, right? It's because of God's grace. Not only because of God's grace, it's because we're over here on this side. It's because we accepted what God did for us if we're on this side. Sinners sin. That's what sinners do. They don't understand the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. So when you see a sinner sinning, he's just doing what he's told or what he knows to do. J.C. DePlano said he was a good heathen. <laughs> he tells the story, boy, I was a good heathen. <laughs> and all of us were really in our own right. We were all good sinners until God brought us into his light. And then we do not want to be part of that lifestyle anymore. Right. So, as the world as a whole, we do not judge the world of sinners. 
but amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, we have the right to say something to you. It's biblical. Right? So when you see a brother sending a sin that is not unto death, then it is our responsibility to go say something to make things right with our brothers and sisters. But not in a condemning way. Well, of course not. Absolutely, Tim. Right. Absolutely, Tim. It's, it's your attitude, as Renee said, it's your attitude towards that person and how they do or do not receive it. Now, if God tells you to go do something and you go to speak to them and they don't receive it, then whose problem is it now? It's theirs. It's theirs. But if your brother or sister receives it in love, then you've reconciled a brother and it says you brought it back into the sheepfold, right? right? But if one has or has not offended another, and then one goes and asks for forgiveness, and the other says, I'm not forgiving you, then who's who's got the problem now? The one that is, that is unforgiving, right? But me or we or us that have brought our hearts to them in forgiveness and asked for forgiveness, we are in right standing with God now. And that's all we can do. That's all we're responsible for. You're responsible for the person in the mirror. I can't make Wayne love me. I'm sorry, Wayne. <laughs> I tried, <laughs> but you just don't like me for some reason. I just think you'd have to be sitting right there. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Once I ask for forgiveness, it's between uh, that person and whether they do or do not forgive you. If God asks you to go to your brother or sister in Christ and say something to them, do it quickly. Do it quickly. Because if not, the devil will talk you out of it. Do it right then and there. And that healing process can begin immediately. And it's a wonderful thing to be reconciled unto your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a glorious thing because that's what God wants us to do. Man, it just, whoo, just feels good in your heart. God loves that person, but they don't love their way. Well, of course not. He doesn't love the wickedness that's in our hearts. Exactly. How about pointing your finger if you punch somebody? It's three pointing back every time. So I point like this. <laughs> oh boy! See, I, I get around that. <laughs> no, I don't do that. Oh boy! Verse twelve is the answer of the people to Jeremiah, revealing their stubbornness to re and refusal to repent and be saved. So there is no hope that your warning will change us, but we will walk after our own devices as we will everyone to do his do the imagination of his evil heart. The answer of the people to Jeremiah reveals how determined they were to do evil <laughs> when the human heart, the mind, the will, and the attitude is corrupted by sin. It is deceitful among all things and desperately, hopelessly wicked. This thing is horrible. I don't trust Thomas to even judge my own heart because Thomas might think everything's right and God says, nope, nope. There's some stuff down inside your heart you need to work on. Me? <laughs> don't be, don't be uh, shocked when God tells you that about your own heart. <laughs> and like I said, be quick to do what God has told you to do. Right? Because it does not allow the enemy to get a foothold in your life. God doesn't tell us to do something that's going to be detrimental to our spiritual health. God tells us things to do that is going to benefit our spiritual health. And if we do those things that God has told us to do, then there's reconciliation. We grow and we move on. It's called maturity. You know, you can be 20 year Christian and not be a mature Christian. Because you're not following what God told you to do, even though you've been saved for 20 years. But, you know, there is a difference, right? 20 year old baby Christian. <laughs> And a two or three year old mature Christian. Depends on how you receive the word and how you respond to God's word. They were desperately wicked. And that's, boy, that's the condition of some of our hearts, right? Why did the people who perished in the flood refuse to repent at the preaching of Noah? Because, as the Bible says, every imagination of their thoughts, of their heart, was only evil continually. For the same reason, Judah and Jerusalem refused to repent and sinners refused to repent today. Only God, by His Spirit, can change the heart. Only God can look at your heart and tell you what's wrong with it. 
we might, like I said, we might think we got it all figured out, but guys, it's new. So there's things inside your heart you got to fix, right? God takes the heart of stone and can turn it into a heart of flesh and a heart that is repentant unto him. And then, he, then you can receive the, the peace that God wants everybody to feel inside their own hearts, right? And that is a good thing. I wanted to get to this one today. The consequences of rejecting God is foretold. Jeremiah chapter 18. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Ask ye now among the heathen, Who hath heard such things? The virgin of Israel hath done a horrible thing. Verse 15. Because my people hath forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from their ancient past, to walk in paths in a way not cast up, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passeth thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as the east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the days of their calamity. Don't read on for just a second. Stop right there. It's Jesus, God says, they have forgotten me. They have forgotten me. Is it a good thing to forget where you came from? <laughs> no, 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 no. Remember, you was a healing at one point in your life too, right? Remember, you were in desperate need of God's salvation in your life too. You were in desperate need of God's mercy at one point in your life also. All of us were. <laughs> right? <laughs> do not forget where you came from. Do not forget who God is in your life. It says, because my people, they have forgotten me. That's a that's a scary thought that you could just totally forget what God has done for you and, and go off in the deep end and forget what God has done for you. Right? Most of us have come far enough to know that that's just not going to happen. But these people were so led by their sinful desires that they had totally forgotten what God had done for them. Now, here's what I wanted you to see this. The very horrible thing Israel had done was their departure from God to serve false gods of the Gentiles. Stop. <laughs> they were serving false gods. This, this kind of rocked me when I read this last night. They were serving false gods or idols. Right? We've talked about idols, idols in our heart, other things that are not of God, and that serving an idol is a bad thing, right? Anything that we set up before God is an idol, right? Anything we put above God is an idol. And when we serve flesh, our own desires, our own will, our own, our own self-worth, that is an idol above God. Now look at this. Why does the worship of idols or false God have such a corrupting effect on people? Stop, don't read it. <laughs> Why does it have such a corrupting effect upon the people? I didn't know this until I read this last night. It's, it's pretty crazy. Why does worshiping a false idol or an idol have such a corrupting effect upon the people? This is crazy. Because, as the Bible tells in both the Old and New Testament, the worship of idols or false gods is, in fact, the worship of demons. <laughs> and it gives about four or five different scriptures right there. You can go back and read them yourself. Wow. So, when you worship an idol, it says you're worshiping a demon. That's crazy. No wonder the people's hearts are turned to stone. No wonder the people are so wicked. No wonder the people are so determined to do that evil is in their hearts because they turned from God and they started worshiping demons. And worshiping demons, what are they going to send you? Where, or how are they going to lead you? Down a path of destruction. Right? So worshiping idols is literally worshiping a demon. That is scary. That the worship of demons, that they had turned 
from the truth of God and they had started worshiping demons. The worship of demons leads people away from the truth of God and away from righteousness and on a path of destruction. That is what had happened to the people of Judah and Jerusalem as a consequence of their idolatry. God's judgment on Israel for the wickedness of their idolatry was in fact what they brought upon themselves with stubborn determination. They done it to themselves. God gives us every opportunity to repent and whenever we wind up in a devil's hell, whose fault is it? Ours. It is our fault. He has given us every opportunity available to get you out of hell. He does not want you to end up in hell. A way to escape. There is no, great, no such a great temptation. But he said they went there with stubborn determination. That is crazy. They were so influenced by the demons that they were worshiping that they, had, they were so consumed by the things that the demons instructed them that they went there with stubborn determination. No matter what God said to them, I am not going to turn from my wicked thoughts. <laughs> so we have to be very careful how we live our lives, right? Do you think we could fall in that trap? Yes. Have you seen ministers that have been in a ministry for 20, 30, 40 plus years and they say, you know, they're gays or whatever? I don't know, whatever. I don't think <laughs> pick something. I don't pick the list. Pick a list. You know? How does that happen? How is that even possible to serve God for 30, 40 plus years and then wind up falling at the very end? Is our heart's deceitful about everything, and we are drawn away by our own lust. Our own lust. <laughs> right. Now, is there still forgiveness after that? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. As long as there's still breath in your body, there's still redemption. Yes. There's still restoration. Right? So, are any of us above following? No. 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 You probably are. If you think you are, you probably already started to fall, right? You've already started to fall. Pride goes before humility, right? <laughs> so do not think that you're so high and mighty that you cannot fall in these same temptations. Do not think that you're so in touch with God that you cannot be tempted to do things that would just, you never wise ever even thought you'd even done. The devil is trying to destroy you and to destroy your witness and destroy who you are. He absolutely hates you. He hates the God inside of you. He hates the Jesus that's inside of you. That's who he hates. And when somebody comes against you, it's, we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and demons. It's not that I hate my brother. It's the demon inside of me hates the life that's inside of you. Or vice versa. Right? It's all spiritual. It's all a spiritual war. And if, and if God could open up our eyes to the things of the Spirit right now, we'd go... <laughs> right? <laughs> if you could look out through the congregation or look through a, a Walmart and walk through or wherever you want to look and see the spiritual warfare that's going on at that exact moment, we would all be like, oh, <laughs> because it's exactly what's happening. It's a spiritual warfare. Thomas, I want to add something. Sure. Look at 19 and verse 5. It says, they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire and burn off mm -hmm. Do y'all know that in the United States right now, that they're erecting hundreds of arches to Baal, symbolized off the, the original Baal temple in Syria. Thomas is up there talking about what happens when we, when our this is really what God's saying when a nation turns away from Him. The look what He says He brings. Mm -hmm. And our country is doing the very things that you're talking about. They are doing it now. And they're also doing it in London. Mm -hmm. So if there's ever been a time to pray over the people that are turning to their own lust and their own will, our country's doing it. From what I understand, they're teaching kids in Disney to accept gay marriage, children. Mm -hmm. They're walking in the bathrooms with yeah. 
Yeah. But is there, has, did God see this happen and did God make a way for us to go out? He made us, they, he made a way for us to, to be redeemed. So are we scared by what's going on? God's will will ultimately be accomplished in the earth. Right? With or without us. <laughs> no matter what we do. No matter what we've done. Right? Any last comments? <laughs> we thank you, God, that you guard our hearts against these things. That you're, that you're, the Spirit of God is inside of us teaching and showing us that how wicked the how wicked our heart is and that through the power of Holy Spirit you are showing us that there's things inside of us that we need to uh, bring before you and that we need to repent and get those things out, God. We submit to the will of the Holy Spirit and that as you show us these things, Father, let us to be allow us to be quick in our response to what your word says to do, God. We thank you for this word and I pray right now that the enemy will not destroy the seed that has been planted and it bring forth that harvest, God, 36 and 100 fold. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>